the Vitality team was commissioned, um, as I mentioned, along with the pastoral team, to keep the conversation about church vitality fresh. We don't want to become so busy doing church work that we're not having checkups. The church is a living organism, and if we don't have checkups, we might develop a bug and not know it. So the group is tasked with coming up with strategic, high-level recommendations around these 10 missional markers to promote health and growth. And we do this by getting input from the body, praying for God's will, and then their recommendations will continue to come back to me and the pastoral team and say, here's how we can do a better job of, of outreach. Here's how we can do a better job of helping people who are in need. Here's how we can do a better job of really looking like the body of Christ. Um, and so I want to ask my church vitality team members, can you all stand? So, because I want us just to pray for you for a moment. But those of you that are here, can you all just stand? So just kind of take a look, take a look around. We don't want to call them up, we don't want to call them up front, but we've got, just keep standing, we have Miss Benita Nunez over here, who's really new to our ministry, about a year or so, we, we went to college together, so we've known each other for years, but um, she has a background in business, and uh, I wanted her to be able to help us to look at how trends change and affect our world, because everyone else is looking at, cha at trending changes, but the church. Everyone's changing with the times, and we're still the one dressing like, talking like, singing like, stuff that happened 400 years ago. And the world's changed a lot in 400 years. Um, then we have Dr. Joseph Tolles over here, who's um, um, a researcher and a scientist. And I, I love the fact that he knows how to analyze data and be objective and, um, and have absolutely no emotion. And I felt that <laughs> he's got lots of emotion. I just had to get him once. Uh, <laughs> But no, be able to help us to look at information and change and data and demographics and say, how does this change? How do we read this? What's God trying to say to us? What God's trying to do to us? And we need to bring that part into it. I really appreciate it. And then um, we have Corey Burke-Bickler here, who's actually chairing the team. And she's bringing this team together and, um, and helping them to stay on point because this is a gift to us as a congregation. And so let me tell you, while they're just standing there, um, can we just have folks who are part of Found of Life? Oh, and... Yeah, can you say their names, too? Because I, I don't have that whole list here. So it's Sarah. Cause That's right, and Brian Russell. We're forgetting anyone? Is there anyone else we're missing, team? All right, so it's Pastor Brian. That's, that's Sarah Hatchett and James Hatchett. You got that? All right, now, Joseph, I really was kidding about not having a heart. I know you got a big heart. I was just, I was just messing with you. Don't do nothing to me. All right. Listen, I want to just ask um, my FOL people who are just seated around these folks, um, can you just put your hands on, on the folks that are standing, please? I need my praying people doing that, all right? If you haven't prayed this week, just kind of sit there and look at the bill, just look at the bulletin, all right? All right? <laughs> if you and Jesus aren't talking, just sit there and talk to him right now, but just leave my people alone, all right? <laughs> Jesus, I'm so grateful for this team and for these folks. I pray that you would give them wisdom and grace and strength to be an aid to me, to offer this great tool to our congregation to make sure that what we do brings life and love to this congregation. We pray, God, that we would uh, be a loving community, that we would be rooted in the word, that our lives would be transformed, that we would be intentional about our evangelism that we would want to see the world transform, that we'd want to understand what's going on around the world better, that we'd have a strong Christian community, that worship would be real, that we would be sacrificial in our giving and in our living, that we would have godly leadership who we can trust, and that we'd be able to communicate what we're doing in an effective way. What a gift, what a gift, what a gift this is to the body of Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you will bless them. I'm so proud of these individuals and so appreciative. Bless them in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Can we just give them a hand as you all take, as they take their seats? You know, I also love the way God is changing up things and um, helping leadership to look different. I took a group of people with me to a vitality training in Minnesota last year. And Toriana went with me, Pastor Brian and Corey. We had a great time just listening and learning about um, how this tool works. And when we were there, it was very clear to me that I really wanted 
Corey to take a leadership role in this because I knew how God had wired her, and I felt that this was a good way for a newer person to lead a church. And it's so interesting, when you come in, I want people to know that this is your church. It does not belong to certain people. It does not belong to the people I grew up with. It does not belong to the people who are related to me, although I'm related to about a third of you all. Um, it's not to the people who give the most, but it's, it's your ministry. And so we were talking about it, we are going back and forth, and she kept pushing it off, pushing it off. I said, Corey, why won't you do this? And she said, well, Pastor, I'm a woman, and I'm white. And I said, Corey, I thought you had a good reason for not doing this. <laughs> and so, um, you know, you come into a new structure, and you see things, and you wonder, is this my place? Can I do things? But listen, you all, God honors our gifts and our wiring. The world looks at a lot of stuff and separates us. But I want you to know, this is a huge step for Corey and for the team. But I just want you to realize you have talents and abilities, and you're probably sitting back on them because you think you're young or you're divorced or um, you have a troubled background or you don't know the scripture real well. Rather than sitting there trying to figure out why you don't fit in, you don't belong, why don't you ask God, where do I fit in? We need you. We need you. There's some folks right in this section that ain't doing nothing. I need them. I need them to do, I need them to do some. I need them to do some stuff. And so, not you, Coop, but, you know, y'all know who y'all are over here. I won't even look. I need y'all to do some stuff. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. All right. Becca, I need to get back in the spirit. Let's just do the chorus once again. <laughs> the world that had been released, released to Satan because of Adam and Eve's, Eve's sin was restless and broken. Bloodshed sin ridden because of the loss of the focus of God it was divided between nation nationalities gender economic status social status divided 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 and because humanity was divided, it could not fully reflect the true image of our holy God. So the brokenness of humanity hindered the brightness of heaven from shining in our planet. And earth needed some light. Earth needed some warmth. Earth needed some love. Earth needed some hope. Earth needed weeding. And irrigation and some care. What the monarch could not produce, what couldn't come through Saul or David, what the priesthood and the judges couldn't produce through Samuel and the great prophets of the Old Testament, what Michael and Gabriel could not do with their might and their authority and even being in God's presence. What the holy lineage and the holy angels and the holy family and the chosen people could not produce. Christ, the word of God, second person in the Godhead, said, Father, prepare me a body that I'll go in the world and show your love. When we as the body of Christ sing Emmanuel, we utter something from our souls that at heaven knows we understand what you did for us. When the body of Christ utters the word Emmanuel in praise, we send a message that reverberates throughout all of hell that we understand, we understand, we understand. Scripture speaks that hell was created for Lucifer and his fallen angels. But Emmanuel came to the earth to make sure that we did not have to go where Lucifer went and that we would not have to have the same fate that his fallen angels have had. And so I don't know about you all. Maybe I'm old school. Maybe I don't know. But when I say Emmanuel, it just makes me want to stand to my feet. I just don't feel right sitting down saying Emmanuel. I just don't feel right looking through my program when we say Emmanuel. I just don't feel right just trying to figure out what everybody else is doing and where this thing is going. When I open my mouth and say Emmanuel, when I begin to say Emmanuel, I am sending a message back to heaven. I am saying, Roger, I have heard your message. Come on, don't you want to lift your voices and say 
Come on, let's sound like we got joy. Rejoice. Let heaven know. Last time, no music, please. Sing, people. Emmanuel shall come to the holy Israel. Now you need to give heaven a shout right now. Come on, come on. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Come on, where are my clean drug addicts? It's because of Emmanuel. Where are my recovered broken people? It's because of Emmanuel. Where are my reconciled people? It's because of Emmanuel. Where are my fatherless men who have found fatherhood in God? It's because of Emmanuel. It's because of Emmanuel. It's because of Emmanuel. It's because of Emmanuel. Come on, don't look at me. Begin to worship. 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 Come on, don't be ashamed. He wasn't ashamed of you. Come on, come on, begin to worship. Begin to worship. Begin to worship. Hallelujah. Oh, oh, oh God. Oh, 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 God. Come on, somebody help me praise him up in his place. Hallelujah. We had no hope until Emmanuel came. We had no strength until Emmanuel came. We didn't have a right in heaven until Emmanuel came. We were not sons or daughters until Emmanuel came. Oh, somebody help me praise him. Come on, come on, come on. Oh. Oh. Come on, I challenge you. Just say, Emmanuel, we praise you today. Oh, come on, that was cute. Emmanuel, we praise you today. Emmanuel. Oh, oh, oh. I owe him a praise in here. I owe him a praise in here. I owe him a praise. I owe him a praise. Does anybody owe God a praise today? Does anybody owe God a praise? Does anybody owe God a praise? I owe him. 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 Oh, yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. I, I pay my debts to the Lord. I owe him a praise. 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 I owe you a praise, God. Listen, anybody in here told God that if you would heal me, I'd tell it. If you deliver me, I'd tell it. If you break this addiction, I tell it. If you heal my mind, I tell it. Oh, if you just touch and fix it, I tell it. Well, you owe him a praise in here. Well, then, sister, you owe him a praise. Well, then, brother, you owe him a praise. You owe him. Come on, where's somebody who's bold who say, God, I owe you praise. I owe you praise. I owe you praise. Listen, listen, listen. 
If you quiet, that means you paid it to him already. If you quiet, that means you paid it to him already. But if you know you still, oh God, if you know you still, oh God, if you know you still, oh God, I thank you, Jesus. A hallelujah. Come on, then I want you to begin to put your hands together. I want you to begin to put your hands together. I want you to give God what you owe him. I want you to give God what you owe him. I want you to give God what you owe him. I want you to give God what you owe him. Go on, tell the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Listen. Don't overthink it. Listen. Don't overanalyze it. If you breathe in the day and you know you're supposed to be dead, if you say today and you know you're supposed to be crazy, if you're sober today and you know you're supposed to be hot, if you're employed today and you know you're supposed to be poor, if you got life today and you know you are headed to hell, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Hey, hey, hey. Listen, I know a lot's going on in the world, but God is good. I know there's injustice, but God is good. I know there's war and mayhem, but God is good. I know there's destruction, but God is good. And we praise you. Oh, Emmanuel. Uh, go on and take your seats if you can. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. Ah. All right, now we're in the Lord's presence. <laughs> Listen, you all, I want to tell you something. I want to make sure that we don't come and forget why we're here and neglect to give reverence to God. Now, schools don't offer driver's ed anymore, so you young folks, new school, don't know anything about what I'm about to say. But when we used to have those little... Um, simulators in class. We have to learn how to shift and stuff down in the basement of your school. But one of the things we used to have to do in driver's ed was go to traffic court to see how it works. I remember the first time I went to traffic court. I didn't know I worked. I'd never been up in court before. I was a high schooler. You got excused. But I remember I went to court. I was 15 years old. I had my baseball cap on. And I, knew, I, you know, I don't know what made me think. What did, I know I didn't wear that in school. It must have been winter, second semester. But you know, when the bailiff came in, he might have really, he probably understood this is my first time being in school. Probably understood, um, you know, maybe I had not been in court before. I'm glad he didn't treat me like I knew what court was. Um, but he made no qualms. He said, young man, take that hat off. The judge is about to come in. And when the judge came in, they didn't say, you know, if you don't mind it, if it's not an inconvenience, if, you know, it's not too much. Could you just kind of get to your feet when a judge comes in? And I think sometimes we come to worship we don't want to inconvenience people. We don't want you to mess up your starch jeans. And we know you got some big high heels and it's hard for you to stand up and get up on them. We know. We know. We know you didn't wear a belt, so you don't want to stand up because, you know. I just got to remind you all, this is God's house. You know, I, I might be the senior pastor. Becca might be the worship minister. Ryan and Karen might be over AV and sound, and Margaret and Ricky might clean this thing, and Roxanne might run the whole lower level, but this is God's house. And listen, 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 I, I, I'm not a bishop, I'm not a pope, you don't have to stand for me, you don't have to give me cheers, blow me kisses, you don't have to kiss my ring, you don't have to quote me or tweet me. I've got an anointing to preach this thing, but when I'm done, I gotta live it just like you, but when the presence of God comes in this place, 
when the presence of God comes in this place, I need folks from Fountain of Life to act like you know who God is. Now, let me tell you something. That's not code for running around the church because some of you aren't runners. That's not a code to fall out. Some of you aren't fallers. That's not code to do what the person next to you is doing. It's just a code to say, you know what? The king is here and I need to do something to show my homage. So I want you to understand something. Don't let them comfortable brown tweed chairs fool you. That's not for you to get comfortable. Those chairs exist. We got them padded so that they will, so that they will catch you when you fall out in the spirit. <laughs> we thought about getting some hard ones, but we said, you know what? We're praying the Holy Ghost up in here. We don't want nobody to get hurt. So we got some good comfort ones. <laughs> Y'all know I'm kidding, right? I just, I just want us to remember that. I want us... I want us to remember that, you know, there's, there's so much, I'm getting to the message in just a moment, there's so much that's happening in our world, and the brothers had to come and pray for me before service because um, my spirit is heavy. Um, so much stuff is going on, but coming into God's presence, I remember this is not a black thing, a white thing, Asian, Latino thing, international thing. When people have been in trouble, we ran to God. We ran to God. God told Israel a long time ago, when you had enough, run back to me. I'll pick you up. When you had enough, that's what we do. So I, I just want to make sure that we understand we are not people who are without hope. We have hope in Christ. Clumsy, awkward, sometimes just downright ignorant. Not always putting our best foot forward, doing crazy things, being impetuous, impulsive. But we have a hope. When all else fails, we got to know how to run to Jesus. We have to know how to run to Jesus. And so I appreciate those brothers who came back and, uh, and prayed. Because it's just been rough. Just a rough week. And then I drove all the way to Indianapolis yesterday. <laughs> I just said... I didn't, you know, and just, anyway, anyway, never mind. I'm getting the flesh. It's just been a long week. <laughs> no, no, I, I would, they wanted to have some community people come. And so Pastor Everett Mitchell works for the um, chancellor, got me tickets. And um, <laughs> we drove there after a program at church yesterday. We got back at like 4 o'clock in this morning. And so I almost called it sick. Um, but I said, no, I'm going to come because the devil would tell y'all that I'm hungover and the devil is a lie. I'm not hungover. Fred, don't spread the lies. I'm not. I see a tweet in your spirit. But I just have to remind you all, um, I'm on call for so many things that's happening. I'm in communication with our denomination president. I'm communication in communication with... Um, our chief of police. I'm in communication with other pastors. I'm in communication with leaders in the community who want to know what next, where do we go, what do we do. And I walk around all week in this angst and frustration and anger and, and people are calling me from across the country, what are you thinking, what are you doing, how are you handling this? Then I walk into God's presence and I don't forget what's happening in the world, but I feel his presence and I feel his peace and I feel his comfort in letting us know he is our God. And we are his people. And that doesn't mean that I ignore what's happening in the world, but I'm just appreciative that um, this isn't just mindless, that I don't just go read a scripture that makes me happy. Forget what's happening in the world. I, I just, I'm saying this so that you know when your heart's heavy because of life, school, children, parents, work, Christ will hold you. And when Christ holds you, Christ will give you good clarity and direction. And sometimes Christ will say in that moment of clarity, go. And sometimes, a lot of times, God will say, but I just love knowing that even when I don't like what's going on, I love the one who ranks, outranks everything. And that brings me a great sense of comfort and a great sense of joy. Does that make sense? I say this because I know our hearts are heavy, too. I'm not the only one. 
Our hearts are heavy too. But we just have to trust that God is real. That God is so, so real. We just leave our burdens at your altar right now and honor a God who loves us and sees us and cares. In Christ's name, amen, amen, amen. Listen, let me just talk to you for just a few minutes, good people. We're talking about love this month. And whether that's, we're, t- we're focusing on God's love or the true love behind this season of celebrating Christ's birth, not the materialism of this season, but the truth of, um, of God's love, I just want us to focus on the fact that we live in a world where our God is real. Our God is real. We talk a lot around Easter about a cross, wooden beams. If you know what they are, you know what they do. But the manger in which Christ was born was also wooden. Sometimes it's carved out of stone, but it's, it's an animal eating dish. I'm not a pet person, but I'm sure those of you who have pets have little water containers or little bitty dishes in those cages or in some room. And no matter how clean or hypoallergenic you swear your dog is, or cat, you would not want to eat out of that tray. You would not want to lay your newborn baby in it either. The image of love, God's love, explained to this world is beautiful. We've heard first Corinthians 13, so often at weddings that we think of this passage as only about romantic love, marital love, family love. But in God's economy and in God's world, love is love. And he tries to give us a picture of this in this chapter. And you've heard it twice, Minister Gloria read it, Pastor Kevin read it. But one of the things I love that comes out of 1 Corinthians 13 is love keeps no score. Now, let me tell you something. And you have to listen fast because I want to talk fast. Because I want us to take this message with us to the Lord's table. The only way for love to not keep score is for there to not be score. Because if there's score, we're going to watch it. You can't pull out brochures and tell people don't read it. That's going to make you read it even when you want. You're not even trying to. Like, shoot, now you got that in my head. Now I got to read. The only way that there can be no score to be kept or to be, or to, is for it to be erased, obliterated, eradicated. The beauty of God's love is that it erases our wrong. It erases our trespasses, our transgressions, our dirt, our thoughts, so that when God really talks about not keeping score, it's not because he's so sweet. I'm going to try not to look at it. Have you ever try not to look at something and you look at it even more? But it means you don't hold it against them. There are folks who are, who are leaders in this church, backbone folks in this church. There's probably very few people they cannot get to in this society, in this community, because of their work. But when I met them, they had ankle bracelets on. I wanted to look at the ankle bracelet because I'd never seen one before. And not to make light of it, I just had never seen a person with one. But I could clearly hear the Holy Spirit saying to me, don't you dare look below the knee. Because if I look at it, I might start asking myself questions. Are they safe? Of the 350 churches in Dane County, 
why would the devil bring this person with an ankle bracelet <laughs> up in Fountain of Life? And listen, let me tell you something. There are folks who love the Fountain of Life, accepts ankle bracelets, because when they walk into other church, they say, have you heard of Fountain of Life? <laughs> oh, I've seen people, dry people, to our church. From their churches, obviously they started there. They put them in their car and drove them to Fountain of Life. And said, I've discovered someone you might want to meet, and here's a pastor you might want to talk to. It's family talk. Can I just be honest for just a second? Please hear this with love, right? Because I'm everybody's pastor, right? I'm everybody's pastor, right? Jovita, right? Okay. I told one of those pastors, stop bringing those black people to me because I don't send my white people to you. I really did say that. So I want y'all to understand, y'all do have somebody special as a pastor. I will say it. Now, I go back home and think, okay, Jesus, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and I don't mean anything negative. My non-black folks, I call you my people. That's just a term of endearment. It means, you know, we tight. But I knew that my mind would start going through these things and this process and these questions. Now, what's interesting is, you know these people and don't know their story. You don't know their ankle bracelet. You still don't know how they got in it. But these folks are leaders and influencers. But I had to purposely not look down. It didn't even matter to God because God didn't have to look down. When God sees them, he doesn't see what you're wearing or what you've done or what your rap sheet is or what your credit score is or what your GPA is. God sees you for what God created you for. Saying that love doesn't keep score. Listen, what stands between you and a lower interest rate? Your score. What stands between you and something that you've been trying to do, maybe purchase a home? Your score. If it weren't for that darn score. Now it's easy. Back in the old days, you had two or three social security numbers. Right, Deborah? <laughs> I don't mean Miss Deborah. I'm just, I'm just saying, I just know Deborah from Chicago, so she understands. <laughs> oh, Otis, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yo, okay, I'll be patient. Just, I'm just working through some things. Just work with me. Just work with me. It was easy, because you have two or three so I mean, that's old school stuff. Say I'm not too young. Computers squashed all that stuff. You got to be smart to be a crook today. You can't just be slick. You, <laughs> you can't do this now. Like, when I was a kid, folks used to get phones in your baby's name. So the bill clerk would call and say, can I talk to John John? Well, John John taking a nap right now. John John is teething. What you want with John John? John John got a phone. My sister didn't use my baby's name again. Be honest. How many people here got jacked up credit? Because you're no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Let me come back here. This is not right. Help me, Lord. Help me. Pray. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But what stands between you? What's interesting to me is. In my opinion, this is just crazy, but I'm not a banker. I think that people with good credit <laughs> ought to pay higher interest rates because <laughs> you know how to manage money. <laughs> you can afford it. I think people with foreclosure and stuff need to have a break. Now, I'm just trying to be funny, but just what, but it's, it, in this world, it's so crazy that if you do have good credit, you can have better breaks. And when you have bad credit, the difference is a score. But what if there was no credit score? What if it was based upon what you could handle, what you could do? What if it was based upon something else? When love erases the score, it gets rid of the classifications. Some folks can't vote 
because of a score that's on the rap sheet. Others can't get into college because of a score on their ACT. I'm not saying these systems are unfair. Listen to me. Listen, be creative right now, right? I'm back in the spirit. Come with me. But when Christ talks about erasing the score, the love doesn't keep score. Love doesn't keep score. Love doesn't keep score. How many times in the depth of arguments we say, every time, or you always, or you never, or can't, that's all got score tied into it. We never argue with people because of who they're going to be. We always argue with every time, every single, did that sound right? That's how you say it, tell me. Every single time. But when love erases the score, it allows us to move in a brand new direction, in a brand new realm, to do some brand new things. So when first Corinthians talks about love not keeping score. This manger where God's love was put on display. An animal eating or drinking trough where animal saliva, an animal, other, other things from animals is there. And God comes into the world to show I'm not keeping score. And I want you to begin to move and walk in purpose. Who would you be if there was no score? Who would you be if your transcript, if your credit report could be rewritten? Who would you be if there was no scorekeeping? What's sad about all the scorekeeping we keep in the world <clears throat> is that when we come to Christ, we bring all that with us. We tell God about our credit report. We tell God about how we messed up. We tell God about who hurt us. What would life look like if you stopped talking to God about who you used to be and you and God talked about who you about to become. The love of God coming into this world, coming into this world is to not give you the power to turn your neck and live in retrospection, analyzing every mistake you've ever made. The grace of God manifested in love came to strengthen your neck to look forward, to look into the gaze of Christ and ask, who are you making me today? Who do you want me to be today? Because God's love helps in that regard. Is that making sense? Love is not boastful doesn't look out for itself. Love is not demonstrated in song or palpitations of your heart. To what extent do you, do you sacrifice selflessly? Because that will show what you love. What I celebrate is love's arrival in this earth. Love's arrival in this earth. Give me just a few more minutes. Let me just talk about the world for a moment. God's message of love is demonstrated in the fact that he came to break what holds people back. He did not just come for heaven. He came to release people in earth to live lives that would glorify and honor God. I want to encourage you and let you know what you got in your wallet, what you got in your soul. I want you to know why God lives inside of you. God didn't just come to give us new, a new genre of music or new literature or new language. He came to give us and offer us a new reality. When love came into the world, the governor got angry. Because when the strangers came to worship love, the ruler, the governor knew that if it got back to the emperor, that people were worshiping anything else, he would move him from his throne. And the people knew that he, that he would probably take their temple. Because that governor gave people a good temple if they gave him good loyalty. So when love arrived, it shook up things. I want you to hear something I'm about to say. We have underrated love. Because true love raises heaven. True love 
will not let your stomach be full and feel comfortable with a hungry neighbor. True love doesn't let you have a closet full of wardrobe and know that your niece is naked. True love makes you act, makes you move, makes you change, makes you share. It makes you become a part of those that are around you. And what's wrong with our world today is they have seen our steeples and our buses and our websites and our churches and our pews, but they have not seen our God because they have not seen our love. When that baby was in that trough and, and, and strangers walked for hundreds of miles or rode on camelback for hundreds of miles, to worship love, it began to send a very dangerous and political message that a new king had entered the planet Earth. And we have reduced Christ not just to a toy or a holiday or pagan celebration, but we have reduced him to a mere, sem- to a, to a, to a, to a mere semblance of a worship experience and have not allowed the truth of Christ to permeate our hearts that we become as selfless as our living as God who was made flesh. And our world is hurting because Christ came to break the shackles. He came to break the bonds. He came to break the strongholds. And for many centuries, the church has been quiet while this happens in our world. They know our songs, but not our love. They know our cookies, but not our love. They know our pageants, but not our love. They know our rhetoric, but not our love. They know our mascot, but now not our love. The message of love coming into our world came to shake things up. Let me tell you what's happening in the world. There are folks who are not seeing love at home. They're not experiencing it at school. And then when there's injustice in systems that should protect, not only do they feel unloved, they feel unprotected. And in the midst of all this stuff that's happening, y'all just listen to me for just a minute. Just give me a few more minutes. In the midst of everything that's happening, while we're debating details and information and grand jury stuff. And just, just hear me out. Because it's easy to it's easier to not talk about this than to talk about it. I, I got a call from one of my friends. Um, her name is Brenda McNeil. She called me last night as we were driving home from Indy. She had just gotten back from Ferguson. She said, Alex, I saw a bunch of young people and they're not church. They don't have a theology for what we're doing, but they're committed. She says, but my heart was torn when I walked with those folks. She said, I cried more than the people from there. I, was, I went to comfort people, and I was crying. She said, but Alex, they looked at those of us who arrived and said, where is the church? So while we're arguing stuff, this is what the church has got to understand. What's the enemy doing? When headlines are, raise, are raising up, I'm always asking, what's the bigger plot? What's really going on? It's so easy to look at the marinette, you know, the meta narrative. But what's the big picture? What's really going on here? What's really going on here is that people who have not felt protected by their parents, loved by their schools, and taken care of by those that should care for them, while they're already upset, they are saying, and the church that should have taught, loved, and protected didn't, and is quiet. Now listen. You can tell me what your response should not be, but that's not the real question. The real question is, what can you do? What the church has got to help the world understand is rather than taking sides and being polarized, let's just say, for example, one of these cases is not as closed and shut as we think it is. So maybe all the evidence we thought we saw is not true. For everyone that's not, I can tell you 15 that are. So I understand the church being quiet on the one that's unclear, But we were still quiet on the ones that were very clear. While we are thinking we're talking about police and civilians in Staten Island and Ferguson, a war is brewing in the spiritual realm where the enemy is telling young people who are not church anyway, we don't care, we don't see, we don't pray, we don't do, we just Take. And so what we have going on in our world is a society that doesn't know where to look. 
or what to do. And it used to be that when plagues broke out, the church said, we got this. When babies were dying underneath bushes, the female deacons, the deaconesses, wet nurse those babies and say, we got this. When the priests were illiterate 1,500 years ago in Europe and couldn't read, therefore they couldn't teach, the church said, we got this. And built seminaries that are now some of Israel's best, um, some of Europe's best universities, Oxford and others, were built as places that taught priests how to read. When young children in London 150 years ago were work slaves, child labor laws weren't even invented. They're working six days a week, 18 hours a day. The church walked up and said, we got this and created Sunday school. They taught kids how to read. They paid kids to come to church after working six hours, six days. They paid kids to come and learn to read so that one day they could get up off that factory line and say, take this job. But it wasn't just the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just the quickening. It wasn't just the him. The church taught them to read. When it was illegal for black folks and other folks of color to read, the church said, shh, we got this. So come here when nobody else is here late at night. We're going to teach you how to read and how to write. Because pretty soon this thing is going to break. And we're going to need you to know how to run for office and start businesses and buy your own farm. This is what the church did. So when I'm standing here saying to the church, it's so easy. And this is why I got to keep, this is why I got to practice it here. When I stand up and say things, folks just say, he's black, he's male, we know why he's mad. We got 1,500 years of history of the church helping the world to read, the church helping the world to heal, the church buried people who were dying in the streets of Europe and gave them a proper burial because of the plague when their own families were afraid to touch them. The church without latex gloves rolled up her sleeves and picked up fleas and bubonic plague ridden strangers and buried them because they believed that Christ was coming back one day and didn't want their rotted, they didn't want their decayed bodies. I'm talking about we got children. They didn't want their decayed bodies in the streets. The church did it. So I can't accept our silence. I cannot accept our acquiescence because this is not what the body of Christ does. When this thing gets tight, we step up. When folks can't read, we step up. When folks are sick, we build hospitals. When folks are dying, we build hospices. When folks are dying, we bandage them. This is not the hour for us to be contemplative. Love showed up 2,000 years ago because people were in bondage. People were hungry. People were broken. And when Herod killed the Hebrew boys, there were a lot of Hebrew people that were quiet because they wanted their temple and didn't want a new king. They liked the one that gave them a temple. When Pharaoh killed the young boys, it was called genocide. It made the Hebrew people mad. The other people didn't really care that much. I don't know what's going on, but I know the church has got to be part of the solution. Hypertension, we lead it. Incarceration, we lead it. Diabetes, we lead it. Heart disease, we lead it. Mortality, de- uh, um, mortality rates for infants, we lead it. We lead it. church has got to step up. I know sometimes it's hard to hear some of these things. We're trying to figure out what's the message, what's the gospel in here. The gospel was love in a trough, not a single word spoken, through burps and belch, and his mother's breast milk running down his lip. He came to break the devil's back. And the devil knew he came to change the order of things. The church ought to terrorize 
the kingdoms of darkness. Because when two or three of us put our hands together and pray, God shows up. When two or three of us pray, God shows up. We say, that's not right. That's not funny. This is not going to happen. The Lord shows up. And so we cannot celebrate love this season if we don't become love. We can, I don't want to hear people talking about it. We can, listen, we can't. We can't. If we're not going to be love, don't bring no Christmas program up in here. I know you want to see your children all dressed in black and white. But if we're not going to be willing to walk outside of here and pray and love and support good people, we miss love's arrival. Last thing that I want to invite us to the table. Y'all not mad, are you? The reason I'm saying this here because we're family. This is not just to one group or one sect. I want people to understand. I want you to have insight that others may not. I want you to understand this is what the gospel is about. This is not, this is, this is not secondary. This is not, this is not back. This is what the gospel is. In Galatians 4, it said, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, before Mary got pregnant, heaven got pregnant, in the fullness of time. We got all these kinds of things about how to help the fullness of time. People say, go walk in when you're in nine months, and then the fullness of time will come. Eat some hot Mexican food, eat some hot peppery food, eat some hot stuff, and then it'll help the fullness of time come. And you walk in and eating, and still the fullness hasn't come. We don't still understand the fullness of time. Ask us if your grandmama told you what the fullness of time is. You're doing all kind of stuff trying to make the fullness of time come. But when that baby's ready to come, that baby's ready to come. In the fullness of time, life that was, that was hidden, life that was incubating, life that was tucked away, at the fullness of time, that life begins to move into the birth canal and come on out into the world. But I love what Galatians 4 said, that in the fullness of time, before Jesus even came through the birth canal, in the fullness of time, heaven said, enough. Heaven said, enough. In the fullness of time, Heaven had this plan of this incarnation, of the second person of the Godhead, that Christ would put on flesh and be God manifested in the world. In the fullness of time, God already made these plans so that in the fullness of time, love would be conceived in her womb. So in the fullness of time, this woman, this virgin, would bring forth this baby in the fullness of time. I know you like to live in better times. I know you like to live in more peaceful times. I know you like to live in a time where Jesus is coming back any second now. I know you want to live in a time where it's more fruitful and it's not as dangerous, but maybe God created you for such a time as this. Maybe God knew that your grandmama couldn't handle today. Maybe God knew that your mama couldn't handle today. Maybe God brought you into the world and brought you into the kingdom because he knew that he was bringing you into something to bring light in a dark world. Maybe this is not accidental. Maybe you're not a victim. Maybe God gave you strength and backbone and a voice and insight. Maybe God gave you an anointing that you could stand in the fullness of time. I believe that God raised up people like found a life. In the fullness of time, God says, I want to build something with cross-cultural folks. In the fullness of time, this is not accidental. This should not catch us off guard. In the fullness of time, God wants to do something. Your salvation happened in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. That means heaven is saying places, 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 places. You know what happens? In the fullness of time, you're not necessarily ready. My wife would get up to get dressed so they can drive to Chicago and go spend time with my family-in-law on Thanksgiving Day 18 years ago. But it was the fullness of time, and somehow God and Lexi decided this little girl is going to creep into the world. It happens in the most inopportune time. You're trying to do stuff. You're trying to do it. My mom said she was trying to go someplace, so she was curling her hair. She's been in labor for 36 hours. She thought this boy ain't coming. But she's sitting there sweating, curl it, falls out, curl it, falls out. But in the fullness of time, God and I decided, God decided to say, hey, little boy, let's get this thing started. In the fullness of time, she wasn't necessarily ready. It had been 36 hours. Wasn't sure it was going to really happen. She's trying to get her due on. But the fullness of time said, this boy is going to come into the world. Don't you understand? God placed you in your mother's womb because of the fullness of time. Don't you understand? You can't afford to not be in your word. You can't afford to not be on your post. You cannot afford to not be in your prayer closet. You cannot afford to not be connected with what God is doing. In the fullness of time, God brought you into this world to not make this thing worse, but make this thing better. So you got to begin to ask yourself, are you for love or against love? Where are you standing with love? Because love stands up and love shows up and love speaks up and love makes up what others have broken. This is about love, not some sweet, sappy, blowing kisses at Jesus. But who are you bringing out of slavery? And who are you bringing into hope? And who are you bringing out of bondage? And who are you bringing out of fatherlessness? And who are you bringing out of hopelessness? And who are you bringing out of despondency? 
in the fullness of time, heaven decided, Mary surrendered, Joseph acquiesced, and they lined up with what God was suggesting. What are you doing today now that love is knocking on your door? Because the scores have been erased. Don't you dare tell me or God you can't. Because you only say can't because you're referring to a score that happened in the past. When you entered the world, you hadn't walked, but you did it. You hadn't driven, but you did it. You never held a fork, but you did it. You never read, but you did it. You never ran, but you did it. You never grew hair, but you did it. Because it was all ahead of you. You didn't say as a baby, I never did it, I never did it, I never did it. It was all in front of you. Don't tell me what you can't do. Don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you won't do. Tell me what you won't do, but don't lie and tell me what you can't do. Because the score has been erased. There are no limitations. Heaven has built you for what heaven has built you for. The world tries to put all the scores around you to entrap you so that when God says, let's go, you say, I can't. But he does not keep store. What the devil has put on you is not what God is looking at. What he's put in your mind is not what God is looking at. What has happened to you is not what God is looking at. And what's happening in the world is not limiting what God is doing. Love is about to break out in our society through us. Through God's people. But because the score has been erased in silence. Do you hear what I said? And so, because sometimes things are erased and it comes back. Files deleted. So, oh, we found it. Ooh. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? It's another thing to come back and say, we found it, and it's been settled. Love is the only force that has ever threatened and dethroned the enemy. Read scripture and watch me say amen. You're quoted better than you. I, I, you missed the word. The gospel is not the reading of the Holy Writ. The gospel is the living of the message of God. Satan is not threatened by words on a page. He is threatened by God in a life. And love is the vehicle through which God seeps into our world. Come on, put your hands together. Come on. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, let love happen here, God. Let love happen, God. Come on, worship him. Come on, let's worship him. Come on, let's just worship him for just a minute. Come on, thank you, Jesus. 